Hi, I'm Richard Lehan. I'm here with Ed Winkleman at Bruce Silverstein's Chelsea Gallery. Ed has just released the follow-up to his bestseller, How to Run a Commercial Art Gallery. Ed, can you give us some context on the new book? Selling Contemporary Art, How to Navigate the Evolving Market, that was just published by Allworth Press in September 2015. Um, the book is the second in a series of books, hopefully. Uh, my first book is How to Start and Run a Commercial Art Gallery. I started talking with my publisher about a revision to that book about two years ago. And we decided rather than rewrite that book, because not very much has changed in that field, it would be interesting to do sort of a follow-up that was more the graduate level, more about the strategies than the simple logistics that are discussed in the first book. It's a big commitment to write a book. What was it that motivated you to choose to do this right now? Well, to talk about the themes of the book, it may help to say that I realized a little bit into it that what I was doing was both deconstructing my first book as well as sort of trying to answer the question, is the Leo Castelli model still viable? The Leo Castelli model is essentially the model that I used to write the first book. And Leo Castelli was a New York art dealer who didn't necessarily innovate very much about the way one sells art. He sort of consolidated it and set it out as a set of best practices. And virtually every young dealer who knew Leo Castelli or was influenced by Leo Castelli um, approached their gallery thinking that that's simply the way it's done. That's the way that Leo did it. That's the way it should be done. And um, a lot of the dealers that I know who are operating right now began their galleries thinking, indeed, the Leo Castelli model is the way that it's done. But the various themes that I'm looking at in the book began to pull that model apart a little bit. And so as I was writing each chapter, I was thinking in the back of my mind, how does this affect what I wrote about in the first book? Is that model still viable given these things that are now evolving or changing? Is the Castelli model sustainable in light of market developments? The Leo Castelli model is a phrase that somebody else coined long before I started using it as a framework in my book. Um, very specifically, that author used it to describe a gallery um, approach which included discovering artists that very few other people knew about, uh, building and uh, protecting a market for those artists, and with the um, centerpiece of that model being that there was loyalty between the artist and the dealer, that they were in it for the long haul, and the hope was that they would grow old and rich together. And that arrangement, that gentleman's agreement, if you will, was the heart and soul of what people meant by the Leo Castelli model. Very specifically, that permitted a dealer to invest a lot of money up front in an artist to sort of help create a market for them, take some risks, do some shows that wouldn't necessarily pay for themselves because they, the, the thought was that we'll be together many, many years from now and what we'll do today will just benefit us both down the road. Um, one of the things that we discuss, or I discuss quite a bit, I say we because a lot of the things that I've talked about, quite frankly, have come from panel discussions and other things, but uh, one of the things I discuss in the book for a fair bit is how there is a threat to that model coming uh, very specifically from the rise of the mega gallery. And um, the idea of whether or not artists and dealers are loyal to each other in the same way they were when Leo Castelli built his gallery is one of the things that's explored in depth in the book. You extensively discuss issues of globalization. Can you give some examples of the challenges? In the chapter on globalization, I discuss several strategies a mid-level or small gallery might approach or might take to kind of deal with the ongoing globalization of the art market. Uh, one that I spend a fair bit of time on is this notion of collaboration. And collaboration is um, being explored more and more by galleries in both a, a defense sort of way as well as an offense sort of way. And what I mean by that is galleries are collaborating. Uh, a gallery from Paris uh, that I know teamed up with a gallery in Berlin very specifically to keep bigger galleries from poaching their artists. And the idea is if I have an artist and I have a gallery in New York, uh, my artist really wants international attention 
And so a big gallery in London starts to show that artist. If that gallery has more resources than I have, and one day I open up a space in New York, I might lose my relationship with that artist. So the strategy is to team up with a smaller gallery in London and kind of share that artist with them, knowing that they don't necessarily have the resources to come to New York and eclipse you entirely, that you can have this mutually beneficial relationship move forward. A really good example of that is the Paris Gallery, Jocelyn Wolf, who collaborated with a bunch of uh, friends and uh, other dealers on a space called KOW in Berlin. I think initially they were kind of very tightly collaborating on that. I believe Jocelyn has pulled back a little bit and isn't as involved, but they have shared artists and that model is a really good case example for other galleries to follow. And again, it's a defensive move so that the bigger galleries in Berlin weren't sort of, you know, giving the Paris galleries artists a show here or there and then next thing you knew, representing them exclusively. So. Uh, what we're seeing a lot more of with regards to collaboration are two galleries um, proposing and then presenting an art fair booth in collaboration. Uh, an idea there would be sort of one gallery has a very well-established artist, one has an emerging artist, and there's a very interesting dialogue between the two of them. These types of proposals are very popular with the, com the selection committees of the fairs, uh, and it's a win-win for the galleries participating. They split their costs and they double their uh, exposure. So, and then they get into these bigger fairs. And um, there's a few art fair directors that I interview for the book who say that that is actually still a very popular thing among the selection committees. So it's another strategy in terms of collaboration. Um, there's another idea about collaboration that um, I think we're going to talk a little bit later, and it was another question you had, I don't know if I want to preempt that just yet, but it doesn't really pertain to globalization, but it actually, now that I think of it, I do want to say it um, is happening, and these are like joint events between galleries, it's happening because galleries in small pockets of the world feel the need to attract an international audience, to let that audience know that they exist. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they meet some of these international collectors at the art fairs they get into, but it's really important to them to bring those collectors back. Uh, the most successful of these in the whole world is um, Berlin Art Weekend, and it may be phrased slightly different, it might be Art Weekend Berlin, but it brings collectors from around the world. And there was a joint event of collaboration among galleries there who were just not seeing those collectors any other time of the year. Can you discuss the impact of the mega galleries and the stage of the phenomenon that we are at right now? So the phenomenon is something that's constantly ongoing. It pertains to each individual artist. And very specifically what I mean by that is art is often a very slow boil. Uh, an artist may take decades before they're making the work that will enter the canon and be you know, culturally very significant. Um, the mid-level gallery system has, for the last 40 or more years, provided this ongoing support system for artists so that they could experiment at a pace that didn't necessarily have to match the goals of the mega gallery, the goals of the art fairs, etc. There was a uh, built-in capacity for galleries to have some artists who weren't necessarily even covering their costs, but who they believed in the work of, still participate in the system, still get regularly scheduled exhibitions, opportunities for press, opportunities for sales. And the rise of the mega gallery has started to make that model or that um, support system pull apart at the seams. It doesn't make any sense if profit is your goal or your need actually as you know costs continue to rise and so um, the trajectory is a gallery finds an artist they really are excited about and maybe knows or doesn't know whether or not they can build a market for that artist very quickly but believe down the road long term they can or at least believe down the road long term this artist will enter the canon 
and they bring that artist into the roster because it's important for them to have somebody of that stature in the context that they're trying to build. And <clears throat> more and more, because of the pressure of the mega gallery, dealers are finding out that not only do they not have the time to have the conversations with those artists to discover whether or not they fit into that category of a slow burning sort of, you know, future artist in the canon, uh, the financial pressures don't really permit that to happen as much as anymore either. In fact, a number of the dealers that I respect who have closed their galleries recently have cited exactly that. Their inability to have that relationship with artists anymore is the reason, and that was part of why they got into the business in the first place. Do you believe that these developments are inevitable? Whether the uh, pressures that the mega galleries are putting on the smaller galleries is um, temporary or something that's here to stay, I really wish I had a crystal ball. I wish I knew the answer to that. I think if um, a lot of the people that I know who opened galleries, not because they ever thought they were going to get rich out of it, but because they believed in art dealing as a calling, knew that it was here to stay, a lot of them would just say, okay, this isn't the business for me anymore. Uh, I don't think a lot of them are looking forward to becoming more corporate. I think they're hoping that it is a blip, that it will sort of fade and that they'll figure out a way to survive, um, kind of continuing to do what it is that brought them into the business in the first place. Can you give an example of how these challenges are affecting established galleries? A really good example of a dealer who um, found herself in that situation was Nicole Klagsburn. She had this great line in the press release she sent out about why she was closing the gallery that she had had for over 20 years, uh, which was, I'm not sick, I'm not broke, this just isn't interesting for me anymore. And uh, Nicole is the textbook example of someone who had a great eye, an amazing program, a very um, conceptually rich program, but who felt to continue to succeed and kind of unspoken in that was to not continue to lose her artist to bigger galleries. She needed to start doing the sorts of things that she wasn't interested in doing. She needed to operate more like a corporation and sort of lose the ability to talk with her artists or be in their studios the way that she wanted to. So it wasn't a financial issue for her. It was really this model, this um, business had evolved to a place where it just wasn't what she wanted to do anymore. She has since gone on to a number of projects and collaborations. So um, I do see a big trend in dealers who are like, you know what, the brick and mortar sitting there and competing at the art fairs model really doesn't make any sense to me anymore but I have the passion. I'm still very interested in um, you know, these artists and their projects, and I will find a way to kind of bring their projects to the public. So um, there's a chapter in the book on the post brick and mortar dealer, and there's a few examples of high profile dealers who are doing very interesting things in that vein. And I would, you know, with more time, added Nicole to that as well. How can galleries best respond to these challenges? Um, the second part of the book looks at things that dealers actually have control over. And it begins um, discussing a conversation that I've had for a number of years now with the art dealer Elizabeth D, who is a uh, inspiration to me in the way that she has approached uh, things since the recession. Um, but we have discussed for a number of years the only way that galleries can deal with the sort of paradox that they're faced with right now is to not let somebody else define what success means for them. So very specifically, what I tried to sort of uh, communicate in the second part of the book is that these are people who are defining success on their own terms, and that those are the only terms that should matter to anybody who is an entrepreneur and starts their own business, and letting the system define what success means to you, especially in something that can be as individualistic as running a gallery, just makes no sense to me. I think people have kind of gotten caught up. People have gotten caught up in the glamour and the press and all the rest of that of the mega gallery system. 
and let that lead them to make decisions they would have never made were that not happening. How has the rise of the mega gallery affected collectors and con connoisseurship? So the, the rise of the mega galleries is definitely having an impact on connoisseurship, if only in the way that um, it's eliminating the need for individual collectors to develop connoisseurship. One of the things that I discuss in the book with regards to the, the, the buying strategies of most collectors is that at the emerging level, the prices are so low, it's a no-brainer, just buy a bunch of them, you're not really going to lose that much. In the mid-level, where the prices have risen to the point where this is actually real money for you now, you want uh, an assurance that you, know, you are making a smart investment. At the blue chip level, and this is the level where the uh, mega galleries are operating, the assumption is that most of these artists, if not all of them, are already in the canon, they've been vetted, and your money is safe buying that work. So if all you do is buy from mega galleries, you don't really need to develop your own eye, you don't need to sort of study art history. Every choice you make seems, at the moment at least, to be a sound investment. Some of the mega galleries artists won't pan out that way, it's just not possible that they all will, but the majority of them probably will. And so the mega gallery existence in and of itself has eliminated the need to go out and learn and study on your own. Of course, at that price level, not a lot of collectors can actually buy um, consistently from the mega galleries. And so I am kind of optimistic that the mid-level galleries will continue to kind of push. And the mid-level galleries only continue to exist if connoisseurship remains in place and part of the collecting culture. One other thing about mega galleries has started to occur to me lately, we, and in the book I do go to great lengths to praise the mega galleries for the quality of the exhibitions that they create, as well as the fact that none, no other dealer can deny they have increased the overall size of the contemporary art market to like unimaginable uh, size. Uh, but I've seen a few mega galleries do what I think is the right ethical thing for them all to start doing moving forward, which is to collaborate with the smaller galleries who they're poaching artists from. Uh, I won't name names, but one gallery is really great at this, one of the mega galleries. They will let the smaller galleries who discovered and nurtured and actually built the market of the artists that they poached have access to that work over the course of several years. That money is the only thing that helps those smaller galleries survive. And so that mega gallery is doing both. They're building kind of the program that they want and they're charging the prices that they want. But by letting that smaller gallery have some of that access, they're keeping that mid-level gallery healthy. And if that happened more, then the mid-level gallery system could keep doing its job, finding the artists and feeding them up to the mega galleries. That's all fine. But um, when the mega gallery just cuts off that connection between the artist and that smaller gallery, that's where the real existential threat starts to come in. Is the poaching by the mega galleries disincentivizing mid-level gallerists from investing in artists? Um, zooming out and looking at the gallery system holistically, there's no question in my mind that young galleries will continue to pop up constantly. We're not going to see the, the death of the gallery system below the mega gallery anytime soon. And the mid-level of the gallery system will probably continue in, in certain ways as much as, you know, the same way it is at the moment. Um, what I do see the mega galleries influencing are the type of people willing to be a mid-tier gallery. Uh, I do think that what I would call the true believers may kind of make career changes. They won't sit there knowing that every time they discover an artist, the artist is just going to be poached and the, uh, the payoff and the investment they put into it is never going to come back to them. I can't see sensible people doing that unless um, they're extremely wealthy and it's really more of a hobby for them than, a, than an income. Are art context ethics strained by the market developments? Ethical standards are not universal, they're unique per industry by definition. And so when we talk about ethics in the art market, uh, I, I like to sort of bring that point to the forefront very clearly. Um, with 
regards to what defines honesty in the art market uh, and what could make somebody, you know, be honest in the way that uh, the book discusses being required to reach the mega gallery stature is treating your collectors the same way that you're legally obligated to treat your artist, which is to ensure that everything you do is in their best interest. Now, I don't believe in New York State you have the same legal obligation to collectors that you do to artists because you're acting as their agent. But I think the dealers who still treat their collectors that way benefit from that. Are art fairs now a necessity for even the most idealistic of gallerists in order to remain financially sustainable? So how essential the art fairs are to any given gallery's success varies depending on who you're talking to. Um, and the more I think about it, the more I talk to dealers, I think it relates very specifically to their goals. Um, very few galleries that I talk to don't wish or feel the pressure to do fairs. They all are hearing from their artists, so their artists think that they should be doing fairs even if they're not doing them. But a lot of galleries will tell me, point blank, the fairs are the only way they survive. They're not making anything close to enough sales through the gallery itself, even through their online efforts, as they need to pay the rent and their overhead and themselves and everything else. So uh, yes, we have reached a point where a lot of galleries do rely on sales they make at the fairs to sustain the business, no question whatsoever. Um, but again, I, I know a lot of galleries who don't do fairs and I think they just manage to, well, they manage the expectations, whether they're losing artists who are a little more, more ambitious to other galleries or not is, you know, is another question. But um, they, they, that model is viable. You can sort of eschew the entire art fair system, uh, but you're probably never going to get really wealthy doing that unless you have a niche market that the whole world just has to come to you. If you're playing the same game across the board with everybody else, the art fairs are almost critical, I'd say. Are mid-level galleries providing ambitious content while blue-chip galleries monopolize the profits at the art fairs? There's a phenomenon happening right now where the big art fairs, the very expensive art fairs, that a lot of smaller galleries are clamoring to get into are really only benefiting the big galleries that are doing them. Partly that comes from the fact that to get into those fairs, you have to impress the selection committee. And to impress the selection committee, you have to bring something that stands out. Very often galleries translate that into something spectacular, maybe a site-specific installation or something like that, that really doesn't have much of a market. Uh, Annette Schoenholzer, who is a former director of Art Basel Talks in the book, about a gallery virtually in tears at the end of the fair because they had brought something and it didn't sell and what are they going to do? This was all the money they had. They'd rolled the dice on this one thing. And she's like, well, look what you brought. Did you think that that was sellable in any context? Why would you think that was sellable here? We only let you in with that because you said that that's what you wanted to present. And her point was that the fairs can let you present it, but they can't sell it for you. So there's... Um, a meme that the younger galleries are expected to bring the new sensational and or literally just to bring the street cred to the fair while the bigger galleries get to cash in by more or less selling the brand names that they're known for. How can galleries best respond to this? The best advice I have to a gallery who wants to get into the big fairs but doesn't want to lose their shirt on it is to propose at the it, it, it's all about timing. Propose a uh, booth of one of your artists who is sellable and you know the work is sellable at the time when they're about to have a major museum show or a major uh, magazine cover. That's the key. Don't sort of think um, too much about sort of making a big splash. Time it so that the selection committee has heard of that artist. They know that show is coming up and it would be embarrassing for them not to have that artist in the fair. So be a little more strategic, but definitely don't do the spectacle if you can't afford to do it. That is a bad way to go. In the book, you cite Tom Weinrich regarding the breakdown between art criticism, scholarship, and market value. What does this mean to you? 
So very specifically, when a gallery would get a New York Times review on Friday, that Saturday afterward, they would be flooded with new people. They would come in with clippings of that review and they would generally sell a lot more that day than they had sold you know, throughout the run of the show. That phenomenon is more or less evaporated. Um, and I think to a large degree, when that was really important, when a review would bring the crowds in and help sell the show, there weren't as many channels for information about art that there are today. I think, you know, the New York Times and Art Forum and Art News and Art in America were the only ways that collectors could learn about what was perceived as good. Now they can get information like constantly. And so I think that those reviews aren't as critical and so that they're not leading directly to sales the way they used to. Uh, that has done two things. I think it's made the dealers care less about those reviews and it's sadly made the collectors care less about those reviews. And so I am a little concerned about the role that um, our criticism can play today in the art market. Most art critics would say they don't have a role in the art market, but um, the fact that they're talking about their little lessening influence suggests that that was one of the things that they would sort of pride themselves on, that they did actually have an impact on the art market. Has your relationship to art criticism changed? My relationship to art criticism has unquestionably changed over the last 20 years. Um, I, uh, in addition to being an art dealer, also do a little collecting, and I don't know that I necessarily pay that much attention to art criticism when I'm buying. Uh, I like to flatter myself and think that's just because I've developed my eye, but that's the same argument I hear from every collector. Um, with regards to being a dealer, art criticism, my, my relationship and my thoughts about it are exactly the same. It's still really important to me that there be a historical record of the exhibitions that we do, that the dialogue get out there, that people debate the work that the artists are presenting, and art criticism, really well written art criticism, is still the best means of having that conversation. What can you tell us about emerging trends regarding post brick and mortar gallerists? There are some great examples of what I would call post brick and mortar dealers. And some of the things that they share as key characteristics, um, first and foremost, is they still have the spirit of a gallerist. Uh, they approach presenting artwork the way that gallerists present artwork in a space. They usually kind of sweat the details about the entire experience for the viewer. Uh, the other thing that separates them from perhaps a private dealer or a uh, advisor or some of the other sort of post brick and mortar careers that dealers are known to go into is that these folks still have a boatload of credibility in the commercial art market. No matter what they do, no matter how they frame it or contextualize it, the big wigs in the commercial art world still pay attention because of their track records. What are Jeffrey Deitch, Mary Spirito, and Jay Gorney doing right in your eyes? The characteristic that defines Jeffrey Deitch is his own personality. He is larger than life and um, he's interesting in and of himself. So whatever he's interested in, a lot of other people find interesting. And he's got the track record to prove that what he's interested in is going to be sort of fabulous and worth your time. Um, the major characteristic of Mary Spirito, other than just being brilliant, is she's a true believer. She will find and show great artists that um, took her years to kind of go out into the world and discover. And she's in the trenches and um, she will show very historically important work, but also some brand new artists coming out of someplace nobody knew that there was an art scene and give them the same sort of treatment. So Mary's a total true believer. Jay Gorney is probably for me the most interesting in that I think he's going to start changing the perception of what somebody can do as a dealer post brick and mortar. Not only is he curating really great exhibitions and I know selling them very, very well, he's being accepted. And this is a, a big sort of step in the art market. He's being accepted into art fairs because of his history and because of his knowledge. The art fairs are still saying, well, if you don't have a space, we won't let you in. 
Jay Gorney is starting to break that down, and that could have a big impact or big implications for other dealers. Excellent. Do you want to add anything? No, except that these were really great questions, and your, <laughs> your, your attention to this is really impressive. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for, thanks My for, pleasure. Thanks for this wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you. Fun. I can't wait to see